My cause was the cause of freedom and equality for myself and for my people. And I'd rather be a corpse than a coward. Mary Ellen Pleasant. Hello, social media. It's Stephen Middleton coming to you from Lancaster, South Carolina. I am with the Possibility Action Network. Our mantra is, I am, I can, and I will. I am Possibility Man. This February, I'm sharing on the topic, entrepreneurship, great moments in business. Today, the spotlight is on Mary Ellen Pleasant. But first, an announcement. I share information with professionals and business-minded individuals about a category creator, breakthrough technology that turns on your body's ability to heal itself, improve athletic performance, and reverse aging at the, at the cellular level. Many doctors and health professionals consider it to be more important than the discovery of DNA. To learn more about this technology, call my information line at 803-339-1101 or send me a Facebook friend request and a personal message. There is some confusion about Mary Ellen Pleasant's birth, but I will not analyze that subject here. She was definitely born in the South, possibly in Georgia or Louisiana. She approximated her birth year to be between 1814 and 1817. Later in life, Pleasant told the reporter, my mother was a full-blooded negress. The slave owner took liberties with her and fathered Mary Ellen. On the state laws and community standards of the day, Mary Ellen was black in spite of her white father and light complexion. Whenever she was known to be black, people treated her that way. This was how the one drop rule operated in the United States at the time. Her owner sold her to a family in Massachusetts when she was approximately six years old, and Mary never saw her mother again. The New England family could not legally keep her as a slave, so they made her an indentured servant. They would free her from servitude once she reached the age of maturity. Mary Ellen learned to read and write while living with this family, and she also became an excellent chef, a skill which served her well in later years. Once she was emancipated from servitude, Mary Ellen moved to Boston, where she met James Henry Smith, who, like her, was of a racially mixed background. Both of them allowed the community to think whatever they wished about them, and they openly supported causes as abolition and civil rights. Once they were married, Smith introduced her to white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. She also met John Brown, the white abolitionist who was, late, who was willing to arm enslaved blacks to fight for their freedom. By the late 1840s, the, the Smiths had made many successful investments in real estate and gold. They had an estate of approximately $45,000 by the end of the decade, which would be approximately $1.5 million today. Her husband died in the late 1840s, and Mary Ellen married another black man named John Pleasant. She began looking for greener pastures in the burgeoning Northwest. Her new husband, John, did not want to leave Boston, and they parted ways amicably. Mary Ellen Pleasant made a strategic decision. She would move to San Francisco, California, the free state that had joined the Union in 1850. The gold rush had also reached a fever pitch, and San Francisco was a fast-growing city. Entrepreneurs like Pleasant would supply the newcomers with vital commodities, including entertainment. Not only did people have gold and silver fever, San Francisco was the railroad's final destination from the East. Surely the West was booming and Pleasant wanted to be a part of this prosperity. 
She took her money to San Francisco and immediately began investing it. She knew that the newcomers would need a place to live, buy supplies, and they would also need domestic services. Pleasant invested in boarding houses, laundries, and supply stores. She had carved out a nice niche for herself. But she did not know the in-crowd, influential men in business and politics. To learn about the power elite, Pleasant got a job as a chef for a wealthy family in San Francisco. From the parties her employer hosted, she frequently got job offers from wealthy men wanting to pay her good money for her services as a chef. She was already making good money, she thought, earning roughly $500 a month, the equivalent of $16,700 today. Pleasant got an insight. Since people liked her cuisine, she would open a restaurant. She took full advantage of the environment. That is, she learned about other investment opportunities from her guests who came to eat in her restaurant. But she faced a few challenges. First, she was black. If whites found out, it would limit her ability to enforce contracts uh, if she ended up in court. Second, her sex limited her possibilities in a male-dominated world. Pleasant had always turned to her own wisdom when she faced a major decision, and she came up with a plan of action. She would not publicize that she was black. She would downplay it by not talking about it, as she had done in Massachusetts. She was not trying to pass as white. Her racial background was strictly on a need-to-know basis, and she told some of her black confidants that her mother was black. Secondly, she had been depositing her money into a savings account and other investment instru instruments at Wells Fargo, which had a non-discriminatory discrimination policy for blacks and women. A clerk named William Bell handled her accounts. Over time, they became friends and later business partners. She trusted Bell and placed investments in, her na in his name for safekeeping. Pleasant and her business partner also bought a mansion large enough to house both of them, including Bell's family. They opened a brothel in the building. They also bought silver and gold and dairy farms. Whatever Pleasant touch seemed to prosper at the time. In just a few years, Pleasant and Bell had amassed a fortune. In 1860, they reported a net worth of approximately $30 million, close to $942 million in today's money. Pleasant continued to support her causes, abolition and civil rights, and she donated money for the fight. As an agent on the Underground Railroad, she hired black refugees when necessary. She arranged for their passage to Canada. She also funded John Brown's attempted raid on Harper's Ferry, where he hoped to open the arsenal and arm enslaved blacks to fight for their freedom. Pleasant helped John Brown with the plans and contributed $30,000 to the effort. Once captured, John Brown had a note in his pocket that read, the ax is laid at the root of the tree. When the first blow is struck, there will be more money to help. Pleasant signed the note MEP, but the authorities read the letters wrong and were on the lookout for someone with the initials WEP. Prior to her death in 1904, Pleasant acknowledged her involvement in the conspiracy. She asked that his, her epitaph, that this epitaph be placed on her tombstone. She was a friend of John Brown. Pleasant ran into financial trouble when her white business partner died. His widow didn't want to give her any of the money and started rumors about her, about Pleasant. First, she claimed that Pleasant had murdered her husband, but the coroner ruled that his death was accidental. Next, 
the widow began spreading word of her presence through racial background. And third, she began telling people that Pleasant was a conjurer and had cast a spell on her husband. The rumors eventually took toll and nearly bankrupted Pleasant. But they did not conquer her indomitable spirit and the desire to fight for free for civil rights. Many black San Franciscans knew of her racial background. And all the while, they, uh, and they also knew she would fight for them. Whenever a black individual had a problem, such as needing a job, they turned to Pleasant for help. To them, she was known as the Black City Hall and the mother of the, mar of the civil rights movement. When Pleasant no longer had a reason to play the color game, she went public in 1870 and identified herself as black on the census. Pleasant did not look for society to validate her. She said, I, as I reflected on my life, I often wonder what I would have been with an education. I always notice that I have something to say and people listen. They never walk away from me or go to sleep. This is Stephen Middleton. I am with the Possibility Action Network. Our mantra is, I am, I can, and I will. And I am Possibility Man. We care about certain things. We care, for example, about individuals obtaining optimal physical health. We also care about individuals obtaining emotional well-being. And we care about individuals achieving financial fitness. We have the right tools. So connect with us if you or anyone that you know are interested in these matters. Until next time, I'm, I'm signing off. Good day.